Hello everyone, welcome to another Foreman Committee demo. For questions, we are on IRC, the Foreman, or on Twitter uh, for Foreman Project. So uh, today, by the way, we have some people in uh, Germany for Open Source Camp uh, for Foreman. So thank you to everyone presenting there and participating there. I hope you guys can see the demo uh, here later on. Um, as a reminder, CFP for Config Management Camp, it was reopened and it still will end in about four weeks on the 3rd of December. We still have room there. We do have a Foreman Room and a Foreman Hack Day confirmed. So if anyone wants to submit a talk or a workshop for the Hack Day, that's welcome. And it's open until the 3rd of December. Uh, tickets are also already available to join the event itself. Uh, 124, we have RC2 out. We did need to skip RC1, found a few things right when it was uh, built. So uh, we did skip one and RC2 is our first RC for 124. Please go ahead and test that out. And we also have 122.2 and 123.2 about to be released. We have a long agenda today. Uh, so let's go ahead and start. Oleg typed parameter. Hi everyone. Uh, this is quite a little topic. <laughs> uh, previously we had just one option to set uh, hosts parameters uh, and it was called hammer host update and then the option parameters and you can specify and override the existing ones but since uh, foreman now has uh, for each parameter its type you can specify the type of parameters uh, we introduced the new option called typed parameters uh, the previous one is uh, we have left the previous one because of backward compatibility, but if you use uh, the if you use that option, uh, the server side by default uh, will uh, uh, will set all the parameters to string type. But if you want to uh, create a boolean parameter or whatever, uh, you can use the typed options, uh, typed parameters option. Mm -hmm. I will just show it. And then you specify key values uh, for each parameter. Uh, the old option uh, allows you to specify the very simple uh, in a very simple way uh, for example for for example bar first will be type 42 and then you just go on uh, but that parameters option uh, something new <clears throat> and um, and it's quite hard to specify it the first time when you use it because uh, sorry, because uh, the old option uh, contains just name and values but uh, with this option <clears throat> you can specify parameter type and uh we wanted to um, add some help section for it so uh, if you are not familiar with uh, this kind of options or you don't know how to use it uh, first time you can uh, you can see the help and there is a section which describes how you need to specify your parameters um i'll just show it how it can look like
And yes, this uh, this option allows you to uh, set any type. Uh, allows you to set parameters of any type. In this big mode. That's it. With old one, you can do just string options, uh, string parameters. And that's. And here is it. I think that's all. Great, thank you. And we continue with you for the uh, Ingal Kushim. Thing command. Oh, yeah. And here I'm back. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Recently, we introduced the new uh, Hammer command called ping, uh, which obviously pings the server. Uh, it uh, it already existed, but it was uh, not extensible. <clears throat> it just ping the. Uh, it was used to ping just catalog uh, services. So the old one command looks like something like this. Uh, but now uh, the uh, endpoints for pink uh, or hammer commands are extensible. So you can, if you are a plugin writer, you can extend this uh, command and, and just put your data you want to show. By default, it pings uh, the server and returns the uh, status all of uh, services. Uh, for example, from the server itself, it um, returns, it pings database and then catalog services. Also, with this command, there is uh, a new one, a really new one, uh, called status. <coughs> Uh, by default, it uh, and yes, this is extensible command as well. But by default, it um, uh, retrieves from the server all the needed information, like um, like uh, server version, API version. Again, uh, pings database, then returns your a list of installed plugins also checks the smart pro proxies for errors as well <coughs> if there are any uh, and uh, retrieves the information about computer sources and yeah pings all the uh, services uh, what else uh, you can retrieve status by Mm, how, to, how to say it? You can get status of any installed plugin uh, if they uh, allow you to do it. Uh, for now, you can <clears throat> retrieve the status of the server and all of, let's say, all of the information. Or if you're not interested uh, at, at that, you can use or specify <clears throat> Um, what you want to retrieve actually. So if you want to get status of uh, Tello plugin, just here's it. Uh, I hope it it is useful and that's all from, from my side. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Oleg. Now moving on to Andra with the entitlement reporting. Hi, so I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, 
We can hear you, but we don't see your screen yet. Yeah. There seems to be some kind of problem with my browser. Um, it doesn't allow me to share my screen for some reason. Okay, so mm. we can move and get back to you in a few minutes. Okay. Okay, so in that Sorry case, that. let's move to Amir talking about the React Legacy Bridge. You know, everyone, let me just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So today's demo is uh, more, mostly for developers. Um, we created a bridge um, basically to communicate between React content and legacy content. Both cannot communicate between themselves directly because they work differently from each other. Um, so before we understand how does it work, let's start with some background. So Redux basically is our um, state, or is basically represent our state in our client. So we have store, which basically stores our um, data, our client data. So basically it's like a state machine. Um, and if we want to change something in the store, we need to invoke actions. And actions basically can um, change the store and React content can observe the store automatically and can re-render if the store changes. So we, with the actions, basically we can do our logic, which means API calls and et cetera. So why we, have, why we need that mechanism in our legacy view? Basically because we have lots of legacy views nowadays and we cannot communicate with React and with our legacy between the, the two. We need some sort of mechanism, and to do so, we basically use Redux. So basically, we created two functions. One is dispatch, which is in our TFM, which is a global object in our client. This function is visible in our legacy, of course, and with that, we can dispatch an action in order to change the store. So, for example, we can change something in the legacy um, with the dispatch function. The store has been changed and um, a React content can be re-rendered. Um, what about the opposite direction? We can observe the store um, in, of course, the legacy view. Um, if the store has been changed, we can invoke in fact a function um, in the legacy view and we can change something in our legacy. So if the store has been changed, we can observe that, of course, from the legacy as well. So these are the two new functions, and let's see some examples. So this is a, a real example in our legacy file. Um, this file basically updates the FUDN, and we need to update the breadcrumb title. The breadcrumb title basically is a React component, and in order to do so, we need to invoke an action. So as you can see here, we have the TFM object, we can access the store, and we can dispatch that action. And of course, we can give um, arg arguments. So in this example, we give a name, and with that, of course, the store has been changed, and the breadcrumb component re-renders. What about the opposite direction? What about observing the store? So this is a, a real example as well. We have a, in our own content load function in our application JS, we have that um, line, which means this observe the store, observe some part of the store, which is the layout. Why we need to um, observe the layout? Because basically um, the layout is a um, React component. Um, our vertical navigation and our top bar both are based on React. And our content um, now we basically returns from the server as HTML. Of course, we have React Router today, but still it's a new feature and most of the pages still use HTML content. So in order to um, render the layout after the content, um, we need to do some hack. So in order to do that, um, we observe the layout. 
So the layout is part of the store object. And when the layout has been changed, we invoke the show content function. So the show content function basically gets two arguments, get the, um, the part of the store we want to look into, and an unsubscribe function that basically unsubscribe um, the observation. So as you can see here, we just um, check if the layout is not loading, and if we got all of the items, and if so, we are showing the content. So that the other direction to how to um, basically observe the store and change something in the um, legacy view. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, Amir. Uh, Andre, back. Do you want to try sharing again? Sure, I'll try again. Uh... It should work. Yes, we now. see your screen. I hope. Awesome. So today I'll be talking about uh, entitlement reporting. And basically what I did was adding a new report template, which you can find report templates on the monitor and then report templates. And uh, this is the content of the new report template. Uh, it uh, gener uh, generates a report uh, that has a lot of information about your hosts and their um, subscriptions and products that they're entitled to, to consume. And for that reason, you need a catalog to generate this report. And this is uh, the content of the report template. As you can see, uh, it loads uh, hosts and then for each subscription pool, it creates a row and uh, it provides some basic information about the host, such as name, organization, and so on. Um, and then you have also the memory um, and then information about subscriptions, products, uh, quantity, SQ, uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I previously generated report based on that. And because it's a CSV uh, output, you can display it in a spreadsheet like this. As you can see, I uh, don't have too many hosts, but uh, still, uh, and you can see all the columns that are, that were defined in the report template are now now here. Uh, here are the here is the column with pro products and uh, the subscriptions and things like that. Of course, if you find that uh, some of these columns are not useful for you, you can always clone the template and modify it um, and remove some of these columns. That, and that is basically all. Nice, thank you. Moving on to John with content view filter rule preview. All right. Hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, yep. So I added an enhancement in Catello to our content view filters. Um, content views are basically like versioned repositories of content that you can add repositories to and then filter out uh, content like RPMs. Um, and we have these things called filter rules, which you specify certain parameters and it, based on the content type and it filters out uh, when you publish the content view. So I added a way to preview these filter rules um, and I added just for RPMs to start. Um, but for instance here, I have a filter rule that's saying filter out cockpit star, uh, match any name with that glob, um, and filter out all versions. So I can go here and show the matching content and it will give me a paginated view of what the filter rule is actually going to match. Uh, it's searchable too, so you can search it and all the niceties that come with pagination, like size and, um, and not loading everything at once. So this works. Um, for also like something more specific here, I build a, 
x86.64 greater than version 1.8.0. And I can show matching content and see that it matches these three packages. Uh, if it doesn't match anything, it's just going to say no RPMs were matched. Um, and here's just another example with Ansible. Uh, that's only matching 10 packages there. Uh, so yeah, before you before this, it was kind of a guessing game. Um, if you had a more specific query or you kept a, a field blank, for instance, uh, you would publish and then see what the result is. And uh, that can be kind of frustrating to go through that process. So hopefully this clears up any confusion around these. Um, if it's something that users really like and would like to see more of, then we can look into adding them for the other types and maybe adding a preview for the whole content view filter itself. And that's it. Thanks, John. Moving on to Samir with uh, inventory performance improvements. Hey, uh, good morning. Thanks, John. Hopefully, you can see my screen. Yep. Okay. So, uh, today I'm going to demo some performance improvements that we have been working on. Could you make it a little bit bigger? Oh, okay. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes, great. So, yeah. So today I'm going to demo some performance improvements that we, we have been working for in the Ansible Java 7 inventory script. Uh, so this is the report that was created by uh, Ole. Uh, and it was probably demoed a few demos back. So this is the report that we are going to use from Tower to generate our uh, inventory. So I'll give you some background on Tower and how it used to behave earlier. So this is the Tower instance that I have running locally. So, and I have a satellite uh, inventory source, which points to another Foreman instance running on my system. And you can basically uh, now probably go to sorry. I need to share my picture. So I go to my AWX terminal. There's a foreman.ini file which yeah. has all of the details where you point your foreman to. And also there's this new variable okay. called uh, use reports API. So I've turned this to forms. Uh, so this false will replicate the old behavior that we used to have. And I'll just run the job again. Thank you, buddy. Walk you through the logs that are generated. So I have started my job. And if I go to the formal logs, in a while, you should start seeing uh, multiple API calls coming in. So what used to happen is we used to call the host API, and then of all the results that were returned, we would go over every host individually and fetch facts for those hosts. So you can imagine for a large number of hosts, we would be making a lot of calls. Yeah, so this. If you see, we first make a call for the hosts. And so I think I have 10 or 12 hosts on this system. So then we'll start calling every host individually. So it's calling the host API for every host individually. Yeah, so this used to be slow. So what we are, uh, what we are doing now is using the Ansible report that has been added. So you can control this behavior by updating this use reports API well, config in common so Let's set this to the to save. 
And, uh, and we can trigger this to open. Go back to my form and log. So what this should do is basically have one API call to trigger the report with all the parameters that the report needs. And then every uh, 30 seconds or so, you can configure that value. We'll keep pulling the API to see the report that is rendering. And once so, it does, it will uh, Today, return the results up. and it will populate the inventory source hours, yeah. in so, so, today, so this is the first API call that we need to like schedule the report an hour flight, or and this is the call to um, see eight hours if the report right. data was generated so to see while the so report rendering is like running we know, receive a full photo of content five. You know, so then we and then on the next call to the same API, API, we get the data. And this is returned to AWX. So I don't think it's easy to stop sharing. If we're going to be in share again, you know. Let's let's not get into the whole. So now, if you let's, come back to the just, dashboard of the worst, you, know, you can so see all the calls that, that were reported from you know, satellite. Yeah. So these are basically the hosts that were reported from satellite. So it shows you where the inventory came from, and it also creates a job. Uh, for you when you start running the thing, so you can answer some details on the job details. On the job details. on Friday, So, five a.m. on Saturday. One more thing. Go back to the schedule. Here it So I discussed the Foreman in e file, so I just want to walk through some of the conflicts that you can set. So we are, we, we are getting uh, some background noise from you. Um, Tell the people around you to be a little quieter. Is this any better? Yes, thank you. So. Uh, so these are the configs that you can actually control in the foreman.ini file. So, and most of these have default values, which you can also look at the report template in, in foreman to see what those default values are. And if you leave those out, the default values will be picked. And you can also control uh, these values individually from the foreman.ini. All right, that should be good. Thank you. Thank you. Now moving to Jonathan with uh, Catello event handling changes. All right. Thank you, Ori. Hello, everyone. Um, hmm. I'm having some difficulty sharing my screen, it looks like. Um, maybe let's give me for now and I will rejoin and sort that out. Sorry. No problem. Uh, so, Ian, we'll move to you with uh, Pulp3 Yum Repo creation. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so, I'm back with another Pulp3 update, um, this time with uh, Yum Repo creation. So, let's jump right in and I'll just show you. Um, kind of the standard creation and, and how it looks uh, in Pulp 3. So if we go ahead here and 
create a new pulp repository or a new yum repository. Um, everything here looks the same. Let's just put in some upstream URL and download policy. We'll keep it as immediate. We'll show you how that looks later. So we created our repo. Now we can look at what it looks like in pulp. So I'm just looking at the ID here. So this repo has an ID of nine. So first, we need to grab the um, the href for this one. I'm going to copy and paste this in, and then query the pulp API. And for now, I'll just show you what the repo looks like. So this repo is created. Um, you can see it's a href here. Um, but what's more interesting is we can look at um, the remote. Um, a version was created as well, as you can see the href here. Um, but there is not any content in it at the moment because I didn't sync or index. Um, but now we can grab the href for the remote. And you can see all the bits that I typed in there. So the policy right now is set to immediate. You can see the URL is sent to, set to the uh, CentOS 6 one. Um, now we can just check out updating this. So if you want to go down and change your upstream URL to something else, we'll just type in and then you can also change the download policy just to show that you'll see these changes on the remote. So if we look at the remote again, terminal, you'll see that the policy is now on demand and the URL is now set to Google, which I set it to. And then just for completion, um, I can show deleting the repository. just to show that the remote and the repository get deleted. So if we look at the remote, it says it's not found. If we look at the repo, the repo is also not found. Um, so as it stands right now, you can trigger a sync. I won't do that right now. Um, also, indexing is on the way. That is almost finished. So indexing of packages, indexing of errata, module streams. Um, package groups is being worked on on the pulp side. Um, and we need to do some refactoring to get the errata just perfect, but soon enough you'll be able to index that too in Pulp 3. Um, I'll also add a mention in here that we did add a feature where if Pulp 3 is installed, um, it won't assume to use Pulp 3. You can set a configuration to use Pulp 2 or Pulp 3 um, just to help make that a bit more usable for people in the future who are testing out Pulp 3 features. Um, but that's pretty much it for me. And uh, next next demo, uh, hopefully I'll be able to show all of the uh, indexing content um, that will be added by then. But yeah, thanks. And that would be great. Thank you. And we'll try Jonathan's uh, screen sharing again. All right, let's see how it goes. Thanks, Ori, and uh, thanks, Ian, for covering for me there. Screen should be sharing now. Let me know if that isn't the case. Yes, so we see your screen. Excellent. So uh, today I wanted to talk about some changes that we have made um, around handling events in Catello. But first, uh, I'm going to talk about well, what do I mean by event handling in Catello? So um, if you've got a Catello installation today and you go to your monitor tasks page, you've probably seen these things like monitor event queue and listen on candle pin events. And these are mechanisms that Catello uses to uh, 
well, process events in, in various forms. And so these are the things I'm speaking about today. So there are some pretty significant changes coming uh, in this way. And particularly that uh, these things, monitor event queue and listen on candle pin events will no longer exist starting with Catello 314. Now, maybe that isn't entirely accurate because they do exist, but they're just not being run as part of Dyneflow or Foreman tasks, which is what we're looking at here. Instead, um, the functionality is going to be, or has been, moved entirely within Catello itself. And the driving factor behind this were, was uh, some very large changes coming to Dyneflow itself to improve the scalability of Dyneflow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I won't talk about all of those things here, but there is a community thread talking all about it. So if you just uh, go to Discourse and type Dyneflow, I'm sure it'll be the first result there if, if you're curious about what that means. So from the Catello perspective, we um, needed to kind of uh, take over the running of these two processes. And that's exactly what we've done. But before I talk about how we did that, I'll talk about what these things do. And there is some overlap in, in how they perform, but particularly they do things like help in calculating errata applicability, um, importing new subscription data, keeping host status up to date, whether we're talking about subscription status or system purpose status. And we even use it to um, facilitate the uh, auto publish of composite content views. Um, where we want to ensure that these things are happening on a serial basis. And because uh, we only have one instance of these running, um, that helps us achieve that. And when uh, particularly having one instance of this running was one of our major considerations when migrating this to some kind of new system. So I've built something that uh, will run in the background of Gatello, uh, running these two identical processes. And uh, all of the behavior that we have today is still there in the sense of what these things do and also kind of the resiliency that Dynflow provided us. We had to kind of recreate some of that. For example, if our, uh, if our connection is lost to the database or if the connection to our Cupid message system is lost, it'll recover and continue to process the events. A quick demo of one of the more interesting aspects of, of this. So I'm going to stop my Rails server and restart it again. And I'm running a Puma, which has uh, three workers. We should see that at the very end. There we go, worker zero, one, and two. Now, um, I'm just gonna come over to a different page, make a request. And upon that request, we see that the Catello event daemon has been started. This is the new reincarnation of those tasks, which I was showing on the, the tasks view there. And it started in process 9210, which corresponds to one of our workers here. And uh, if I make a subsequent request, we're not going to see that data about the daemon being started because we already have it started um, in this one process 9210. Like I mentioned, the key is to have only one of these running. And we've come up with a mechanism that achieves that. And so I've killed that process, 9210. And Puma has detected that and started process 9296. So if I go back to my browser, sorry for jumping around so much. If I go back to my browser and I make a new request. Well, there it is. The event daemon has started once again under process 9296. Um, the process ID is pretty much coincidental. It really corresponds to whichever process that was running server the request first and we'll only have one so in a production environment if um, you know processes are being recycled by puma or passenger and that daemon process happens to be the process running that gets recycled well the next process that takes it over will like that comes uh, up will likely take over that daemon responsibility and so we have a very resilient system to continue processing events much like dyneflow and um, one gap that we saw with this was that historically we couldn't get too much um, information out about you know 
successes and failures of these events. There was some there, but um, it wasn't particularly visible unless you knew to go to look into the task details. But now we've exposed it, made it more visible. It's here on the um, about page, and it'll also be reported in Hammer Ping once uh, I make that change to do so. And so we have no events shown here, but let me go to my console, um, kick off some events. They should be done now. So if I refresh, it'll say, you know, X number of events have been processed, and we have one and two, respectively, for Catello and Candlebin. And uh, I think that basically concludes my demo. Reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Now we're moving to Justin, Pulp 2 to 3 migration. Hello. So as part of the 2 to 3 uh, work, we are writing tooling that uses some APIs that the Pulp team has built to migrate content and repositories from Pulp 2 to Pulp 3. And I'll show you sort of the initial stages of that here today. But first, I'm going to curl this URL that will list all of the files on the Pulp3 server for file content, and it'll grab the count. So you can see here we've got about 14,452. And what I'm going to do is I've configured my dev environment here to use Pulp2. So it's uploading, uh, or it's has a file repo here for Pulp2. Uh, I'm going to upload these two files to a Pulp2 repository. And you'll see here in a second, yep, yeah, it, it updated to six. And if we curl Pulp3 real quick, we should see the same count, 14,452. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is run a rake script. And what this rate script is doing is it's creating a migration plan, which tells Pulp3 how to import all of the items from Pulp2. And right now it's just importing the file content itself. It's creating that plan and executing it in Pulp3. And then Pulp3 basically verifies that, uh, or checks to see if there's anything in Pulp2 that is not yet in Pulp3. And if there is, it goes ahead and imports it into the Pulp3 database, as well as moves it or hard links it to the correct location on the file system for Pulp3. And then at the end, uh, Catello actually reaches out and gets all the identifiers for that new content. So we can see here that the content migration completed successfully. And if we curl again the file content, we can see that it now increased to 14454. So those two files that I had uploaded into Pulp 2 are now migrated over to Pulp 3. And this is sort of the very start of the work. Um, we have Docker content to come as well as actually migrating the repositories and the importers and uh, distributors from Pulp 2 into the correct entities into Pulp 3. Um, as well as Yum content and Debian content uh, looking out in the further future. But that gives you an idea of kind of what the process uh, will be from a uh, sort of a user perspective. There will likely be a form and maintain script that wraps this, um, but when you get down to the nuts and bolts, this is the rig task that gets run. And this can be rerun uh, multiple times, and so on this, for example, the second run, it basically wouldn't do anything because there's nothing new to migrate. And that is it. Thank you. Over to Partha, content view tip solving update. Actually, I'm having some trouble sharing my screen. Uh, maybe I'll Try to rejoin. It's happened a few times today already. Uh, okay, let me try that. Yeah, uh, let me try now. Uh, 
sounds yeah it sounds like uh, i'm not set up for this uh let's i'll do it next i'll do it in the next demo sorry okay thank you so thank you to all of our speakers and thank you for joining see you next time <laughs>